Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So my name is Dan Fay, and I'm I'm here to uh, introduce and uh, welcome Michael Nielsen, um, who's kind of who's joining us today to um, t as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting um, uh, Book Series uh, Speaker Series. So Mike Michael's here to actually talk about um, his book, Reinventing Discovery: The New Era of Network Science, and talk about how the internet is transforming the nature of our collective intelligence and how we understand. Um, the world. So scientists are, as we know in, in our group that we deal with a lot, are you using the internet to dra dramatically expand problem solving ability? And the online world is revolutionizing scientific discovery and the revolution is just beginning. So um, also Michael is a, uh, one of the pioneers of uh, quantum computing and an author of more than 50 scientific papers including contributions to nature, Scientific America, he is an essayist, uh, speaker, and advocate of um, open science. So um, please join me in welcoming him to Microsoft. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much uh, for coming along today, everybody. Uh, it's, I think, 13 years since I was last uh, at Microsoft. Uh, it was really great to be there. Uh, back then, I uh, visited the theory group in 98 or 99. And uh, well, it's, it's nice to be back. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about network science or what uh, you might call e-science or e-research. Um, and that's the subject of my book. I, I want to start out just with a little story that I think is a uh, very striking, very interesting uh, recent example of uh, networked science. So it starts with a mathematician named Tim Gowers. He's a mathematician at Cambridge uh, University. He's one of the world's leading mathematicians. He's a recipient of uh, the Fields Medal, among many other honours, sort of the Nobel Prize in mathematics. Gowers is also a blogger, uh, not that uncommon actually amongst leading mathematicians. Uh, of the 42 Living Fields Medalists, uh, four have started uh, blogs. Uh, two have actually since abandoned them, so uh, 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 that's perhaps not that uh, uncommon or typical of the, the blogger demographic. Anyway, in 2009, Gowers wrote this very strikingly titled post, Is Massively Collaborative Mathematics Possible? And so what he was proposing doing in this post was using his blog as a medium to attack a difficult, unsolved mathematical problem, a problem which he said he would love to solve, entirely in the open, using his blog to post his ideas and his partial progress. And what's more, he issued an open invitation uh, inviting anybody in the world who thought they had an idea to contribute to post the idea in the comments section of the blog. So his hope was that by combining the ideas of many minds in this way, it would be possible to make easy work of this hard mathematical problem. He called the experiment the Polymath Project. Well, things actually got off to a very slow start. For the first seven hours after he opened his blog up to comments, uh, not a single person made any suggestions. Uh, but then a mathematician at the University of British Columbia named Joseph Solomosi uh, wrote a suggestion. Basically it's a it's kind of a simpler variation on the original problem. And 15 minutes after that a high school teacher from uh, Arizona uh, made a comment. And just three minutes after that another mathematician, Terence Tao from UCLA, also a Fields medalist actually, uh, made a suggestion. And things were really kind of often running at this point. Uh, I mean, basically things exploded, in fact. Over the next uh, 37 days, 27 different people would make 800 substantive mathematical comments containing roughly 170,000 words. So I wasn't a substantive contributor, but I was following along very closely right from the start. And it was, well, first of all, it was very hard to keep up uh, just with the the rate at which people were posting ideas, but it was also very interesting to see how quickly I, you know, people would post a fairly half-baked idea and then it would be very rapidly developed, improved, sometimes discarded, sometimes incorporated into the canon of real knowledge about the problem. Uh, Gowers commented that the process was to normal research 
as driving is to pushing a car. And at the end of the 37 days, he posted again to his blog to announce that the problem had most probably been solved. In fact, a, a generalization of the original problem. Uh, they had to go back uh, and check a whole bunch of details, uh, you know, that they hadn't made a sort of a, a bad mistake. Actually, everything did check out, and they wrote a couple of uh, papers as a result of this first iteration on the Polymath project. There have actually been several subsequent uh, iterations uh, since uh, that early experiment. Now, of course, the reason I'm talking about this today is not really so much, you know, it's not important necessarily because it solved a particular mathematical problem, no matter how interesting that problem might have been. It's rather because it, it, you know, the suggestion that some of these tools can in some sense be used as cognitive tools, and by that I just mean that they can help speed up the solution of very hard problems. So, you know, uh, sort of uh, this vogue maybe dates to the book The Wisdom of Crowds some years ago for talking about the wisdom of the crowds. Uh, people are often applying these kind of ideas to relatively trivial problems, counting jelly beans in a, bar, in a jar, that kind of thing. Uh, what's interesting about this problem, of course, is that you know, it's, it's a problem really near the limit of human ingenuity to solve. It, it's a problem that challenges certainly some of the brightest mathematicians in the world. And, and not just that, but potentially some of these techniques can maybe be applied broadly across many fields, so not just necessarily in mathematics. Of course, there's obviously some considerable similarities to ideas from open source software, which I'll return to a little bit. Uh, there's also some considerable differences, and in particular what I'm going to focus on today is some of the real challenges in getting scientists, particularly uh, people doing basic science, um, in adopting some of these tools and using them to their uh, full potential. So as I say, yeah, my focus is going to be particularly on basic science today. So I want to talk about a, a very different example from a completely different area of science, um, one that has nothing whatsoever to do with mathematics, and just focus in a little bit more uh, on this question of how exactly these tools are being useful. Um, so this is a story that begins with a young woman named Nita Umashanka. So in 2003, she finished up her undergraduate studies at the University of Arizona, and she went to India for a year, where she worked with a not-for-profit organization helping young Indian women um, escape from prostitution. Uh, depending on whose numbers you believe, there's anywhere between several hundred thousand and several million women involved in prostitution in India. But what she found was, uh, I guess, disturbing and um, really very discouraging. What she found was that many of these young women had too few skills to hold down a job outside prostitution. So she went back to the United States at the end of the year and she decided after some reflection that she would start a new foundation, which is now called the Asset India Foundation, which would address what she thought was the core problem. By opening technology training centres in India and training these young women in technology, and then helping them find placement with some of India's big technology companies. Okay, So they've actually opened training centres since then in five large Indian cities. Uh, they've trained, uh, hundreds of young women have completed their training courses, and uh, they claim that they've uh, helped many of those young women find placement. So that, that's a nice story. Um, there is, of course, a caveat. Uh, the caveat is this, what they'd like to do is to expand their program into some smaller Indian cities. And one of the problems that they've run into in doing the planning for this is a lot of those cities don't have very good electrical infrastructure, they don't have a reliable electricity. And if you want to run a technology training center, obviously that's something of a challenge. Uh, this causes all kinds of problems for them. One of the things that they were concerned about, particularly concerned about, was uh, wireless routers. How are they going to run their wireless routers? So they did a bunch of looking around. Uh, they looked for commercial, off-the-shelf, solar-powered wireless routers. Nothing they could find was suitable for their local needs. The way they addressed the problem was to go to a company on the other side of the world uh, in Waltham, just outside Boston, named Innocentive. <coughs> How many people are familiar with Innocentive? Anybody? A few people. Okay. So Innocentive is... Basically, it's a marketplace for scientific problems. It's a bit like eBay or Craigslist, but instead of posting a description of your old furniture, uh, you post a scientific problem that you'd like to see solved together with a prize for its solution. So a typical 
it actually is a spin-off of Eli Lilly, um, and the typical kind of organization that posts there is Eli Lilly or you know, another big pharma company, that kind of uh, uh, sector, uh, mostly. They have quite a few. I've forgotten how many companies are signed up, but I think it's like 100. Um, this is probably their best known prize. It's a little hard uh, to read, but it's a $1 million prize to find a biomarker for ALS. It's actually a few years old uh, now. It's a little bit unusual. Most of their prizes are more in the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 uh, dollar kind of a range. So what this has got to do with ASSET is that ASSET got together with the Rockefeller Foundation who put up a $20,000 prize uh, uh, for an incentive challenge to design a low-cost, reliable, solar-powered wireless router that could be made with components that were easily accessible in India. Right? That was the challenge. So Inocentive broadcasted out to their network of solvers uh, all over the world. They claim that there are several hundred thousand people in this network. I have no idea how many of those are truly active. Maybe the relevant metric here is that 400 people downloaded a detailed description of the challenge. This is not 400 people you know, saw the abstract or saw that kind of thing. Many more uh, saw the general description. This is the really long detailed one with all the stuff about uh, IP and there's a whole bunch of uh, kind of details. So this indicates some relatively serious level of interest and 27 of those people submitted solutions. The winner was a software engineer from Texas named Zachary Brown. So he had a few interesting uh, abilities, did Mr. Brown. Uh, in his day job, he worked actually as a software uh, engineer working with open source software, in particular uh, very heavily with Linux, which was kind of helpful. Uh, but he had two more hobbies that were particularly useful. Hobby number one was he worked at home to build homemade wireless radio networks. And he was working towards making contact with every country in the world. Hobby number two, uh, he, he told me actually in email that when he was growing up, he'd been watching television one day and he saw solar panels being installed at the Carter White House. He had no idea what they were, so he's asked his parents what they were. And he was enthralled, that's his word, when they described how you could convert sunlight into electricity. So as an adult, he was working on converting his entire home office, including his wireless radio networks, so that they could operate off solar power. Right. So if you wanted to build a you know, reliable, low-cost, solar-powered uh, 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 you know, wireless, uh, well, certainly Zachary Brown would be one of the guys you'd want to uh, call about this particular problem, I, I suspect. You know, Innocentive just provided a way of making this match. Now, you, know, you might say, well, maybe I've just cherry-picked uh, this example. Actually, Karim Lakhani at uh, Harvard has done some systematic studies um, to see what separates out um, successful Innocentive solvers. Uh, and actually, it's not that uncommon. Very often, what's, what's going on uh, is that the person who, who wins the prize um, is a person who is unusually well adapted to the problem at hand. One of the most frequent comments that he gets from successful solvers is that they don't bother looking at the, um, at the challenge if they realise, basically, if they look at it for more than 20 minutes to half an hour and they don't know for sure that they can solve it easily, they give up, right? In other words, they're looking to see if they already have the expertise which is necessary to solve the problem. So what the Polymath Project and this Innocentive example in some sense have in common is that humanity as a whole already had the expertise necessary to solve these problems. But the expertise was latent. And so what the tool's doing was really activating that latent expertise by connecting the right expert, Zachary Brown, for example, to the right problem at the right time. So this is very obviously true for Innocentive in the way I've described, but actually it was also true in some sense in the case of the Polymath Project as well. If you look in the archives, which of course are, are all still there, you, you see the same pattern emerge over and over. Somebody proposes a half-baked idea. They can't go any further necessarily. Somebody else comes in and says, oh, that makes me think of. Somebody else comes in and says, oh, that makes me think of. Boom, 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 boom. You keep going. Very similar, of course, to what happens in a really good creative conversation, as you can have in any uh, room. 
but you know, the, the relevant fact here, well, there's a few relevant facts. Um, one is that it was carried out at much larger scale. Two is uh, that, uh, where, where am I going? Sorry, so the, the, the much larger scale. Oh, two is, of course, that also it would have been very hard to quickly assemble these people in a room. A number of the experts involved had never, in fact, uh, met one another in the past. And so they got very easy, very lightweight access to this expertise. In some sense, you could say that what the tools were doing was they were kind of restructuring expert attention. And what I mean by that is that instead of Zachary Brown or the polymath sitting at home, they were using their expertise in much higher leverage ways. They weren't just sitting there working on their wireless radio networks. They were doing something that would benefit a large group of people on the other side of the world. So one of the, the questions that I talk about uh, at a lot of length in the book, I'm not really going to touch on much more here, is I, I think it's a very interesting question. How can we design tools which allocate all the different types of expertise optimally? And so th this problem can be split up in a number of ways. There's kind of a technical problem, which is allocating attention where people, individuals, have maximal comparative advantage. You know, certainly Zachary Brown, you know, he was making much better use of his, his time by working on the inocentive problem. But there's not just this technical problem, which is kind of a matching problem, matching people to the right problem at the right time for their particular set of expertise. There's also an interesting incentive problem, which is even if you can actually do that, solve that sort of technical matching problem, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to want to work on that problem. So there is a, you know, an interesting incentive problem. Make it so people are rewarded for allocating attention in these ways. And if you think about a lot of different examples, a lot of different tools, so not just polymath and inocentive, but actually uh, I've given a couple of examples which are widely used in the open source community, GitHub, IRC channels, that sort of things. In some sense, they're all working on this problem. Right? They're all different attempts to, to match the right person's attention to the right problem at the, at the right time. Okay, I'm going to switch track uh, now for the next little bit. Um, I want to talk, I want to go back to kind of basic science and talk uh, uh, about the ways in which scientists are or are not adopting some of these tools. I think it's true to say or fair to say, and I'll try and defend this statement, uh, that scientists have in fact been tremendously inhibited in adopting many of these tools. Certainly if you talk broadly across the sciences, I think that's true. It's not necessarily true in certain parts um, of science. There are parts which are better than others. But broadly, I think this is true. So I want to illustrate that statement with just a few examples. So this is a uh, website that was started in 2005 by a grad student at uh, Caltech named John Stockton called the Quickie. It stands for Quantum Wiki. And it was a very simple idea. It was to develop kind of a research level Wikipedia for quantum computing. And, you know, the, the idea was almost that it would be a super textbook for the field, right? It would be very rapidly evolving, constantly updated with news about the latest breakthroughs in the field, uh, maybe descriptions of some of the big open problems, people's speculation about how to solve the problems, description of what was going on in labs, all these kinds of things. Um, I happened to be present at the workshop where this was announced at Caltech. It's very interesting to chat with people about what they thought. A large, certainly, you know, some sizable contingent of people were quite hostile to the idea. They said, what a waste of time. Why would anybody ever do that? A larger group of people, it's certainly not a random sample, but uh, amongst the people I chatted to about the idea, were very excited, though. Had these interesting conversations, you'd talk for five minutes, they'd, they'd say, oh, you could use it to do this, you could use it to do that, da 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 And you'd get to the end of the five minutes and say, well, so what are you planning to contribute? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't have time, right? Geez, I hope somebody else does, right? It'd be great if such a resource existed, but I don't personally have time to contribute. And of course, if enough people uh, repeat that little story, well, it's inevitable that it's not gonna do so well. So it has essentially failed. I should say, well, there's a number of caveats to that, but it's failed in a particular way. It hasn't, re hasn't recruited a large number of people to collaboratively construct this kind um, of, uh, of knowledge base. Um, actually, as measured by the number of downloads, it's done pretty well. A lot of people want to get information, 
uh, but they're not necessarily willing to take any time at all to contribute. And you can repeat that story across many, many similar attempts to construct science wikis. Uh, just a couple more examples, the Not Atlas, the String Theory Wiki, uh, and there's many more. There's also been a large number of attempts um, to construct so-called scientific social networks, kind of the Facebook for scientists idea, you know, to connect scientists to other scientists with complementary interests so they can share data, share code, share ideas. Um, and a lot of money has been poured into these. There are dozens of them, in fact. Here's just a few. And you know, in principle, it seems like a very good idea. Uh, and some of the sites are quite nicely implemented. In practice, if you create an account on such a site, at least on all the ones that I've created an account on, you log in, you look around, it's a virtual ghost town. Some of the sites actually claim that they have hundreds of thousands or even millions of members. Um, I don't know what these members are doing. In a couple of cases that I know of, I know what's happened, which is the people developing the site have gone to one of the big scientific societies, they've paid for the membership database, they've run a Perl script over it and auto-generated accounts. So they are, in fact, ghosts. Now, what's going on in both these cases, and in many more that I could describe, is of course obvious, but uh, it's worth spelling out. I'm going to move away from the slides for a bit. Uh, you know, if you're, particularly if you're a young scientist, and let's say you want to get a research job at a major research university, well, even if you think, even if you think that the quickie is the best idea since sliced bread, or that one of these scientific social networks is, well, the, the career calculus is not good. Should you spend two or three hundred hours writing you know, a couple of mediocre scientific papers that nobody's ever going to read? Or should you spend the same time making a long slew of brilliant contributions to the quickie? And no matter how enthused you might be, of course you understand that from the point of view of your tenure committee, you'd be insane to spend the time on the quickie. Right? It's just not going to matter. Why would you waste? You know, that would be wasting your time a phrase I've heard many people use in reference to these things. Um, despite the fact that on its scientific merits, you might believe that that's the better way to go. So if you want to get adoption of these kinds of things, uh, you know, it, it's a very tall order. You need to actually change the culture of science, change the incentives and change the reward system in some significant way. And that seems like a very hard problem. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to address that problem in a second. Before I do, I want to just come back to Innocentive and to the Polymath Project and to talk about how they fit into this picture, right? Don't they contradict it? No. They fit in perfectly. What was the Polymath Project doing? They were working in an unconventional way towards a conventional end. At the end of the day, they wrote, have written a series of papers, right? And this was discussed right at the outset. There were discussions about authorship before they'd even gotten started, right? Very much people saw this as an unconventional means to a conventional end. And of course, in incentive, it's an even more conventional end. You know, it's, it's cash. Um, and that's great, those projects are terrific, but it does mean that things like the quickie, which are ends in themselves, people are not exploring. So I'll talk about an example where, in fact, the culture and the incentives have changed in a really dramatic way, and that actually involves the Human Genome Project. Are there any biologists in the room? Is anybody familiar with the Bermuda Project? Bermuda Principles, excuse me? So, let me go back to the early 1990s. It's becoming clear that the human genome is going to be sequenced sooner rather than later. And there's a problem, however. Which is, again, if you're this you know, a young molecular biologist, why are you going to take your data and share it with others? It's kind of the same as the quickie. You're not going to take the time necessary to, to take your data and upload it to GenBank or one of the other big online databases because you know, it's not something that is going to be recognized by your, by your peers. You're not going to list this on your CV uh, uploads to GenBank at that point in time. Of course, everybody in the community could see that it would be best if the data from the Genome Project was widely shared. That was obvious. But that didn't mean that people unilaterally wanted to go ahead and do it themselves first. So there was a lot of discussion. I'm going to kind of skip over uh, some big part of the story, but a really crucial moment occurred in 1996 when the Wellcome Trust organized a meeting in Bermuda, which had leading representatives from the Human Genome Project were there, Craig Venter, who would lead the private effort to sequence the genome, was present. Um, 
representatives from the Wellcome Trust were there, representatives from the US NIH were there. And they talked the problem over for several days and they drafted what are now called the Bermuda Principles. And what these principles state essentially is that if you were working on the genome and you took some genetic data, you would upload it to GenBank within 24 hours and the data would go into the public domain. And it wasn't a toothless agreement. The reason why is because the representatives from the grant agencies went back to those grant agencies and they baked them, those principles into policy within 12 months. What that meant was that if you wanted to work, if you wanted to get funding to work on the genome, you needed to agree to abide by the Bermuda principles. Right? And so, you know, big shift immediately. Right? Everybody now needed to be playing that game if they wanted to get cash. And that's you know, a big part of the reason why the human uh, genome is available today. As I say, I've oversimplified the story. There's a couple of other moments there, but, but that was certainly a big part of it. Okay, that's a nice story, but of course, you know, the human genetic data, as important as it is, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of human knowledge. Uh, even if you just look in other parts of biology, it's really spotty. Depending on what species you're talking about, uh, the situation may be different. One biologist uh, I was chatting with uh, said to me, his comment was that he'd been sitting on a genome for an entire species for more than a year. Right? And that's a whole species of life that's sitting there, the genome, kind of rotting away on his hard disk. Um, and of course, this situation is not uncommon. Actually, this is a, a person who, uh, he, he's w certainly well known in the, uh, in the open source community um, uh, for his contributions there. So, you know, I, I think that's, well, it's unfortunate. When I give talks, um, certainly at universities, frequently I, I ask people to raise their hand to, to say whether or not uh, they engage in systematic data sharing. So not if somebody emails you, you'll respond with, you know, an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, but who actually engages in systematic data sharing. Uh, and except in a, with a, a few particular subfields, the, the standard response is maybe 5% of people uh, make some systematic attempt uh, to share their data. Okay. Um, oh, where I'm going with this, of course, is that, you know, it's not just data. Uh, uh, which is significant, of course. Inside a lot of laboratories, there's all sorts of stuff which is locked up, which could potentially be very useful if shared. All kinds of uh, ideas and questions, uh, a lot of scientific code, um, which could potentially usefully be shared, but which at the moment is not. I said that I'd give you two examples where the culture of science has really changed in this regard. The second example is actually much bigger than the Human Genome Project, but I need to go all the way back to the dawn of modern science to tell, to, 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 to explain this. Uh, and so the example, in fact, well, I'll start with Galileo. So Galileo, 1609, builds his first astronomical telescope, December. For whatever reason, he doesn't point it at Saturn for a whole seven months. But in July 25th of 1610, early in the morning, he points it at Saturn for the first time, as far as we know. And what he's expecting to see is a little disk. This is what he's seen when he's pointed it at the other planets. But actually, straight away, immediately, he sees it's not as he expected. It's a small disk with little bumps on either side of it. And what he's seeing is the first ever hint of the rings of Saturn. His telescope actually wasn't quite good enough to really resolve the rings. That would have to wait for Huygens some years later. But straight away, he knows that this is a huge discovery. I mean, it's hard to appreciate now, but of course at the time, our image of the heavens had almost been unchanged since prehistoric times. Right? So it was a big discovery at the time. And Galileo doesn't announce this to the world, no. What he does is he writes it down a description of the discovery in his private notes, and then he scrambles the letters in that description into an anagram, and he writes letters to four astronomer colleagues, this is within 24 hours, of making the discovery, including Kepler, containing the anagram. So he mails off the anagram to Kepler and three other people, right? What this means is that if, say, Kepler later announces the same discovery, Galileo can reveal the anagram and get the credit. But in the meantime, he hasn't revealed anything, right? I mean, imagine the human genome had been released as an anagram. Now, you know, 
this is not to say it sounds like Gallo is a bad guy, right? But actually, it was a sensible response to the incentives at the time. Um, Leonardo did the same kind of thing. Uh, Newton did the same kind of thing. Huygens did the same thing. Robert Hooke of Hooke's Law fame, which you may, you know, high school for most people, um, he revealed Hooke's Law as an anagram. Right? It was very common at the time. And it's because there was no incentive at all to reveal discoveries. Now, the modern scientist's point of view is to say, oh, we solved that problem. Uh, we solved it with the scientific journal system. And that's kind of a one-sentence summary of a process that actually took close to 100 years. Right? Because scientists were not terribly interested in publishing in journals initially. Yeah. There was no link between publication and career success back then. That was something that had to be constructed in the culture over a period of many decades. The thing that we take for granted today was actually not at all obvious that that was going to happen. So let me give you kind of a couple of example quotes to illustrate this. This is a passage I've adapted from Mary Bowers Hall, who was the biographer of Henry Oldenburg, the editor of the first serious scientific journal, The Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. So Oldenburg would, quote, beg for information, sometimes writing simultaneously to two competing scientists on the grounds that it would be best to tell A what B was doing and vice versa, in the hope of stimulating both men, it was men at the time, to more work and more openness. Right? She has these descriptions of Oldenburg kind of bouncing information backwards and forwards, insinuating that each person was ahead of where they really were, trying to get the other one to reveal the kind of the gap in information. Right? And then Oldenburg would publish distillations of these letters in the Philosophical Transactions. Right? This is a guy who's really working pretty hard to get disclosure. Another quote this is from one of the great scholars of the printing press, Elizabeth Eisenstein. She's writing... She has a great chapter in her book where she talks about the use of the printing press by early modern scientists. And she's just utterly amazed and befuddled by the fact that they didn't want to use it. So here's what she writes. Exploitation of the mass media, meaning books, was more common among pseudoscientists and quacks than among Latin writing professional scientists who often withheld their work from the press. Well, this is 220 years after Gutenberg, right? It's not next week or next year. It's not even next century. It's 220 years later and scientists don't want to use it. So, you know, the, kind of the, the short answer is to say, well, what caused the transition to the modern system was somehow establishing this link between publication and career success. But how, was, how did that actually happen? What was the motive force there? Well, a few things. First of all, the transition actually took decades. Some historians have labeled it the open science revolution. There's a historian uh, of economics, actually, at uh, Stanford named Paul David, He's written a lovely 120-page paper where he discusses the reason for it. And to boil his 120-page paper down to two words, patron pressure is his answer. Like that's what caused this, this link to be established. So let me explain, let me break that down for you uh, and give you an example. This is my example, actually not his, but it's in the spirit of his paper. It's actually the example of the moons of Jupiter, the Galilean moons of Jupiter. So this was actually Galileo's first really big discovery made before the rings of Saturn. And it was, he, he acted very differently in this case. He didn't send off anagrams or do anything silly like that. No, he published very quickly, actually. And he did so for a very interesting reason. This is the pamphlet that he published, or it's the cover of the pamphlet. Siderius Nuncius, uh, the Starry Messenger. And if you look, well, what's actually, what are the largest letters here? It's not Galileo. Medicia Sidera. Why is that? Well, Galileo was not happy with his living situation at the time, and he immediately wrote to several potential patrons, including the Medici, and said, I will name these moons after you publicly if you agree to become my patrons. And the Medici wrote back and said, sure, why not? Right? And that's how he got the patronage of the Medici. Right? And of course, the point here is that funders often have very different incentives than scientists do. In fact, they often have more incentive for openness than scientists do. So actually, I should say, by the way, this was published, basically engaged in, I think it was about a six week long negotiation uh, before doing this. And he printed a considerable personal expense to himself. This was very early days. Anyway, so funders often have more incentive for openness than scientists. And this is at least what David believes was essentially the reason for this open science revolution back in the 1600s. Well, step forward to today, 
And of course, there's a, you know, a real parallel between the story, that story and the story of the Human Genome Project. At least in part, the human genome is open data because of funder pressure, right? At least, it's not completely the story. There was a lot of will on the part of the scientific community there, but the actual enforcement mechanism at the end of the day was, to, to a great extent, uh, those policies implementing the Bermuda Principles. And so I would say that today, we should certainly look uh, to the grant agencies to work, to work towards much stronger open data policies. There are open data policies at some of the big grant agencies. The Wellcome Trust in particular has been very good. Um, but we can expand and strengthen those open data policies so that they apply to a broader range of data much earlier in the discovery process. And not just data, but actually many other kinds of scientific knowledge that is presently locked up. Um, they can work towards open code uh, policies and actually help, not just that, but also help legitimize new tools by encouraging to submit, uh, a scientists to submit non-standard evidence of impact. So if somebody uploads, you know, contribution to a site like the Quickie, why can't it be used as evidence of impact if it's of high scientific quality? Or if they upload, for example, a, you know, maybe a video showing a, uh, to, to, to YouTube, uh, you know, showing in detail how some scientific protocol is implemented in the laboratory. Often it's tremendously difficult to replicate science just because you know, of the lack of that kind of, of information. Um, certainly talking to many chemists, that's true. Um, I guess I would go so far as to say that really, as a broad principle, publicly funded science should in fact be open science. Uh, there's obviously some, you know, a number of exceptions to this, there should be exceptions for confidential and proprietary uh, knowledge. But as a broad general principle, I'd say that publicly funded science should be open science and that there's a huge amount that can be done to work towards that world. The reason why I wrote this book in large part was to help uh, make open science a public issue. There are two reasons for that. Uh, reason number one is that internal to the scientific community, I'd like to see a serious discussion take place about what types of contribution are valued. So it's not just putting papers on your CV, but actually other things that are valued as well. And alongside that discussion, I think there also needs to be a public discussion of what type of scientific culture we want to support by public money. There's about $100 billion is being spent each year to support uh, public, uh, publicly funded research uh, around the world, about $39 billion in uh, the US. Uh, and uh, well, I think the public deserves the best possible uh, uh, system uh, for its money. I'm going to skip over. Yeah, I'm going to skip over just a couple of bits and finish with a little description of some organisations which are doing uh, some very interesting work in this uh, space, uh, and which to some well, I've certainly worked with some of these organisations. Um, uh, the first one is an organisation called the Alliance for Taxpayer Access. This is an organisation that's done a great deal to lobby uh, for uh, open data and open access policies, uh, mostly in the United States. Uh, probably the biggest success so far uh, in terms of a policy shift uh, is perhaps the NIH open access policy. So this was a policy that came in in 2008. Basically, if you receive money from the NIH, it means that your, any papers which you produce with that grant money um, must go into PubMed within 12 months of being published. So they become openly accessible within 12 months of being published. And of course, the NIH is a $34 billion a year agency. Um, so pretty soon, we're going to start to see a lot of scientific literature showing up in, you know, when people do searches and things like this. Uh, it will be openly accessible. Uh, one of the things that they're working on at the moment is the Federal Public Research Access Act. Uh, this is an act that's been kind of hanging around for about five years now. It came onto the floor of Congress in 2006, when it was sent back to committee, came back in 2010, sent back to committee again, uh, which is where it's currently languishing. What the act would do is it would extend that policy, the NIH Open Access Policy, to all US federal agencies with budgets of over $100 million a year. So basically it would mean that any federally funded US research would become open access. And they've also done good work uh, with uh, open data and, and various other things. If there's one piece of legislation I could just wave a magic wand and get passed at the moment, it would probably be that Federal, federal uh, Public Research Access Act. So they're doing really good things. Uh, Creative Commons, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, they're best known, I guess, for their work with general culture. Uh, their licenses, but actually they've done some very interesting work uh, with science as well. Uh, one of the things that they've done a lot of work 
uh, doing is basically going to uh, often large companies and convincing them that actually some of the data that they hold could usefully be made open uh, data. It's pre-competitive or you know, it's not actually in their pipeline of products that they're going to develop in any way. Uh, and so they've, they've done some good work uh, convincing them to make that data publicly accessible. And there are many other organizations which are doing all kinds of interesting work. I've just mentioned uh, a few here. I won't go into details. Anyway, with all that said, thank you all uh, very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, earlier on, you asked two questions. How to allocate attention where people have maximal comparative advantage and how to reward them for it. Yeah. Those questions hit all the keywords to make you think, ah, oh, free market, yeah. how do you reward them with Indeed. cash? But then you came to the conclusion where you said the answer is taxpayer money and public funding. It felt like the two are intention. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, so, huh, of course, yeah. It's a complicated question to give a comprehensive answer to. I will make one observation uh, rather than give a really comprehensive answer. The observation is just this, that in order for a free market to function effectively, of course, there is a need for stable governance structures. Um, for example, the ability to enforce contract law. That's you know, one, one common observation that, that economists make. If you don't have that ability, the free market will not function, typically. And so uh, you know, one way you can view uh, some of, you know, I, I talked a little bit about policy that can be used, is actually starting to, to as a way of starting to create um, or expand kind of the, the reputation economy uh, uh, in science. So it's not just that people um, you know, are able to build their reputations by publishing papers, but actually they're able to build it in other ways as well, perhaps by publishing code, for example, as a first class research object in its own right. And so you know, that's kind of, if you like, a basic infrastructural thing about science. It's a little bit like the contract law, the establishment of contract law, uh, to make an analogy, a somewhat loose analogy. But hopefully you can see where I'm, I'm going with, with that kind of answer. So it's a really interesting question though. Yeah, so here you're talking about scientific discovery. How yeah. about some technology, for example, you know, we have many people doing algorithm development. Not many people don't know which one is better than the other. And government agencies actually very often sponsor a certain kind of challenge. They have yeah. a common database that everybody evaluate their, you know, their, their technique on common database so people sure. know with it. So do you think this kind of uh, evaluation can be done in the market, you know, in the, in the kind of open Sure. So, I mean, of course, the, second, the whole second half of my talk is about, well, actually, let me repeat the question. Basically, it's saying, where else can you do these kinds of things? I mean, that's, I think, the short version of your question. And of course, uh, you know, the second half of my talk is concerned explicitly with a very specific kind of set of incentives and, and institutions. It's the institutions that have grown up around basic science. And so none of that applies in other contexts. Right? Any institutional context you care to talk about, um, you know, so I've talked uh, you know, at, at quite a few different large companies. Of course, each institution has its own internal reward system and its own culture. And so you know, the, 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 the problem is sort of separate inside each of those companies. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to engage in sort of broad general, well, I was going to say I wouldn't want to engage in broad generalizations and then immediately I want to make one. Um, you know, there, there has been, of course, some interesting work done. Uh, you know, Creative Commons uh, is, is an example um, of kind of legal licenses. I guess the GPL is the most famous example of this, um, which can be used to promote open culture in, you know, of a particular kind. Um, and which seems like, a, I mean, it's a, you know, the copyleft provision in the GPL is a surprisingly powerful, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure you know, you know, it becomes harder and harder over time to avoid the pull, you know, as the GPL kind of software gets more and more powerful, ultimately you want to start using it more and more uh, and then you fall under the spell of the GPL. Uh, you know, it's an interesting kind of a general uh, tool. 
uh, people certainly often ask me, is there some analog of that in uh, open science? And, you know, except in really obvious ways, like for example, uh, you know, when you're talking about code, uh, no, not as far as I can see. There's no similarly powerful idea. Yeah. Can I go back to the first half of the talk then for a minute and, and concentrate on the Zachary Brown case? And mostly, Zach yeah, yeah. Uh, if this is, you know, I'm not sure how relevant it is, but it, I, I think it may be interesting. Do you happen to know if Zachary Brown, this person with exactly the right yeah. skill set, actually hang, hangs out on Innocentive just looking to see if something falls out of the sky of him? Or was there a degree of separation thing where... That's an interesting question. So knew of him and passed it along and said you might want to check this out? So I wouldn't absolutely swear to this, um, but my memory of my email conversation with him was that, no, he was a person who kind of like glanced at the, you know, basically Innocentive will send out an email each week in your sort of areas you flagged as being relevant to you. Um, and he glanced at them. Yeah, you know, he didn't spend a huge amount of time. Uh, it's two or three years since I had that email conversation, so I could be misremembering, but but it wasn't it wasn't a I don't think it was a referral thing to answer your question. It's an interesting question actually. Is it kind of a secondary market in the case of Innocentive? It turns out that there are actually other companies who are getting together small s groups of solvers, um, and uh, kind of you know they act as organisational glue um, to. Uh, uh, to attack some of these innocentive uh, solvers, and I'll bet they're doing what you're you're describing. They're actually almost certainly systematically looking for the right experts. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. So, are you seeing a generational shift in um, sharing? What What are the incentives for the younger generation to share? It's a really interesting question. So, so certainly, I, I guess. I, uh, the Open Society Institute, actually, the Soros Foundation, uh, just got me to go earlier in this year and give, uh, I gave about 35 talks at different academic institutions. And uh, so I got a bit of a feel, at least, for how different people will respond. And uh, a really interesting pattern was very senior scientists were often extremely enthusiastic. Very junior scientists were often extremely enthusiastic. And uh, to the extent that I had people get very upset with me, which I had a couple, um, they were often postdocs or pre-tenure faculty. So these are people who are completely subject to the system, but have no power whatsoever <laughs> to control it. So I talked to somebody, you know, senior in a grant agency, for example, and they have a great conversation because they feel like, yeah, you know, for them, policy is a malleable object, whereas for a postdoc, it's... Uh, you know, it's, well, you know, that's the reality they live in and they feel like they have no control over it. Talking to undergraduates uh, and high school students is very interesting though, uh, and I presume this is kind of where your question was going. Um, yeah, you know, they don't know what's going to fail uh, and uh, it's a fantastic thing for them. Um, there's a very nice project, uh, Drew, Drew Endy, now at Stanford, um, started when he was at uh, uh, MIT. Basically they're trying to build a biological commons um, so they have this MIT registry of standard biological parts. The way they're building this is by running an undergraduate competition, actually undergraduate and high school competition. They kind of mail off you know, these kits to kids all over the world and get them to genetically engineer organisms. They come together at MIT. The, the last competition had, I think, 1,200 people come to MIT from all over the world. And they show off these little organisms that they've uh, generated. They do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, you know, they have little motors and they build little, you know, things that fluoresce in weird ways and whatnot. It's kind of cool. Um, but the interesting thing that they're doing is they're encouraging those students to contribute the genetic sequences that they're modifying back into um, this registry of biological parts so that other students in future years can download them and use them as the basis for their designs. And so there's actually quite a lot of part reuse from year to year, and they're gradually getting more and more complex. Um, so, you know, there, the students, they're not responding to the standard incentives at all. They're just doing what seems cool. And uh, they do some pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. yeah so, so in, in response to some of the things that you talked about earlier, uh, I presume, you know, the reason why postdoc and pre-tenure people yeah. don't want to, you know, to be this because they have some pressure. 
for their own career development. So is there any way, maybe you can think about some ways of, you know, tying that kind of innovation through this kind of exercise, through some incentive system, maybe, you know, get some, you know, if they care very much about, you know, publication, tie them all together, pick up the best things out of this, you know, sure. go through, is that going to help both? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of things one can do. The simplest suggestion of all uh, is for people who are senior within, say, a department to append one sentence to job description which says, we encourage applicants to submit non-traditional evidence of impact. That one sentence would make a big difference. Um, it would make a big difference as well if the grant agencies did the same thing. Um, so that's kind of a one sentence uh, answer. It's not, a, it's not a complete answer at all. Uh, but it would make a big difference. The other thing which of course can be done is anything, anything which is used in the evaluation process at all can be modified. So an interesting thing that Google Scholar has recently started doing, just not very systematically, I don't quite understand the mechanism, but you will find blog posts occasionally show up in Google Scholar results. Right? Well, people certainly use Google Scholar when they're evaluating academic candidates. And it would be an interesting thing if those kinds of things started to uh, actually contribute to people's H indices and uh, things like this. So, you know, I don't think there's a, there's a conversation to be had if you know, somebody's blog posts are contributing to their H index. Some committees are going to be very unhappy about this and they're going to say, oh, we should ignore those results. But it's still an interesting conversation to have. Part of what's driven um, the adoption of preprint culture in physics is the fact that very early on in, uh, so there's this wonderful site, the preprint server in physics, uh, you know, if you're a physicist, you start your day by going there to see what new preprints have been uploaded um, overnight. Um, and part of what drove that is the fact that very early on, uh, uh, Stanford runs a service called Spires, which is basically a citation tracking service for the high energy physics community, Spires made a very interesting decision, which was they weren't just going to track citations between papers in high energy physics, they were going to include the preprints as well, and they'd actually aggregate the two. So if you had a preprint version and the published version, they'd combine the two sets of numbers. And uh, I've literally sat in you know, hiring meetings where everybody has their laptops out and they're looking through the Spires citation numbers, and you can see what impact the latest you know, preprint from somebody has had. Um, you know, it certainly hasn't given preprints the same status as papers in physics, but it gives them some status. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's another example. Any tool which can be used to measure, um, if you tweak it in those kinds of ways, uh, it has an impact. Small impact, but an impact. Yeah. So, one of the other challenges we find with the, kind of the open data portion on the science side yeah. is to get that to be, where does it live, and yeah. who pays for it? Yeah. Right, there, there's still this challenge about disks are spinning, electricity's powering it. In the case of NIH, they're you know paying for those. Yeah. When we start going to all these other disciplines, there's not the, let's say, the health-related or some of these other ones that they would um, have the contribution of funding into those. So, yeah. you know, environmental areas and things like that, we see this. And so it yeah. always comes back to, yeah, they might be available on somebody's web server that might be here today and gone tomorrow. So. Yeah, well, actually, uh, of course, that, that, that alone is a significant issue. You may be able to pay for it this year, but, uh, but does that mean you can pay for it in 10 years or yeah. 20 years? Uh, actually, the preprint server is a good example of this that I just mentioned. Yeah. They struggle with funding. Uh, you know, are all those preprints going to go away? Um, you know, of course, I guess the right... You know, you, you want to step back and say, you know, irrespective of... Um, you know, the political difficulties you might have in raising the, the money to contribute to, I don't know, let's say the continued upkeep of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, something which Microsoft has, you know, done a huge amount for. Um, you know, step back and say, well, you know, is it in the best interests of the scientific community as a whole that that data be made available? Well, clearly, you know, there's, what, there's 4,000 papers have been written citing the Sloan uh, data. You know, it's got to be one of the great kind of contributions in the whole history of astronomy. Um, you know, kind of, I talked about Galileo before, well Sloan's kind of, I think, up in the same kind of, same kind of ballpark. You know, I mean, it's a bargain at the current price um, that, that they're spending at uh, Johns Hopkins to, you know, to, to do that kind of maintenance. Um, 
and you know, that's just a question of having the conversation. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think the scientific merits are, are in any doubt. They're getting a real good, real good value for money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the other one that also comes up sometimes is, that, and you mentioned about like the U.S. You know, essentially putting it in policy as a way that, uh, to formalize it. And I wonder if, if you've run across the, the, the idea of the nationalism where, you know, oh yeah, it's great if we do it, and maybe the UK and other, but then you have other countries that may not be following. Yeah, it's a funny thing. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the scientific social networks have been scientific social networks for people from country X uh, for this reason, which, uh, <laughs> uh, really, uh, you know, fortunately, of course, I mean, I don't think it's really that serious a problem over the, the long run. Uh, you know, people are smart. They're, they're not, there are a few stupid people there, but they're, they're not that stupid, yep. fortunately. <laughs> except, well, except briefly. Okay. Well, thank you thank very you much again. Much.